I'm a climate and ocean scientist. And when I speak in public about science, what I often receive is misogyny. When I am passionate, I'm called angry. When I am sincere, I'm called hyper-emotional. When I speak with authority, I am uh, told that I, um, that I am unqualified. And when I voice my dissent, I am reframed as divisive. Angry, hyper-emotional, unqualified, divisive. Such a nasty woman. <laughs> what do all these things have in common? They're all cultural tropes that are used to devalue the power of women in public. And as a woman in public speaking about climate change, I have grown accustomed to identifying and expecting this toxic reframe of my voice. I am what you might call a biogeofeminist, a fun new term coined by the three-year-old daughter of a colleague of mine. You know, inside of institutions, the culture tells women and these institutions can be science, business, and even marriage. The culture tells women, be quiet, be docile, be small, and you'll be rewarded. The thing about that is it's a lie. It's not true. There is no reward inside of a system that requires your docility, only subjugation. So when we tell women that online harassment is not real harassment, or that pregnancy is a professional risk, or that the lack of representation is a pipeline problem rather than a failure of leadership and courage, what we're actually telling women is this. Your bodies and your humanity are a liability. And if you want to succeed inside these doors, you need to check your body and your humanity outside. So for example, I recently attended a closed door summit of women tech leaders recently and I asked the COO of a major global tech firm a question. I said, inside of institutions, women's voices are often reframed as problematic because we as women have to do basic things, like we have to advocate for our right to not be harassed in the workplace, and we have to um, ask and advocate for things, basic things like maternity leave. So how do you, COO lady, how do you deal with this toxic frame around women's voices? So she said to me, when you're in these workplaces, you need to see yourself as a minority, and you need to conform to the culture, and you need to fit in. Another example. I recently attended a public discussion about the efforts to unionize postdoctoral scholars here at the University of Washington, where I voiced my concern about the lack of university-offered maternity leave for women scientists. I was told by the university representative with a straight face, well, you know, if you do get pregnant, you can always take sick leave. <laughs> the ladies in the audience are like, uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> What I want to ask you all this question is, how do women ever win inside of systems that see us and our bodies as inherently problematic? We never win inside that system, but what we end up doing is relitigating our basic humanity again and again in public to systems that do not see us as worthy of fair and equal treatment. Now, as a white woman scientist, I have experienced harassment and abuse and gaslighting but I've also experienced profound privileges and protections that have actually allowed me to pursue science um, from the very beginning. For example, English was my first language. I have had the privilege of a middle class um, buffer and safety net for when I got sick or when my car broke down. My, parent, my, my uh, family um, has never been incarcerated when I was a child. Um, I have never been touched by the intergenerational trauma of gun violence. And I have the profound privilege of walking through the world holding a length of pipe, a bag of Skittles, or a cell phone, and not be murdered by the police state. 
The frame of women's rights is never enough, and how could it be? The compounding intersections of injustice that characterize our culture right now across lines of race, gender, sex, and socioeconomic class mean that injustice occurs at intersections and specific people are targeted. And I have learned through listening to the women of color that are leading our culture right now, including the Me Too movement and the women's movement, that if your search and fight for social justice is not intersectional, it's not authentic. This is where you might be like, why is this white lady scientist talking all this social justice and feminism? So, my career as a scientist is a product of a society that values information and trains a generation of scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians to pay back that investment, that public investment of taxpayer money, I am exactly the person who should be, along with my generation of STEM professionals, stewarding public policy, building public institutions, and protecting public interest. So when I speak in public as a PhD scientist and I receive misogyny, or when I have to advocate for basic rights for other women scientists, there is a direct cost to that interaction, and that cost is negative. And that cost plays out in a couple of ways. So first way is I pay a cost as an individual. Basically, my public brand and authority is degraded. Second cost, women in public pay a cost universally because of the sexist reframing of our voices as hysterical, our contributions as irrelevant, our work as decorative, and our leadership as unwanted. And third, the entire population, we together pay a cost because this represents a loss of taxpayer investment in the scientific workforce. Indeed, marginalization and discrimination cost us real dollars and they degrade the scientific process. White supremacy and patriarchy erode institutions from the inside by rewarding the mediocrity of some and punishing the excellence of others. For example, just this week there was a, a report out in a journal called Nature Geoscience. Hard numbers on the fact that in 40 years, earth science has not had any progress in racial representation. The loss of that number is astounding. It should take your breath away. Because what that actually represents is an incalculable loss of the scientific frontier. We would understand the world in fundamentally different ways if men and women of color were fully represented in the geosciences. And we would know how to steward the planet in fundamentally different ways if they were there as well. In science, we know this basic truth about institutional health and diversity from a very, very different lens, a fundamentally different lens. In science, we have what's called a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary worldview, which means we know if you want to solve a complex problem, you're going to need lots of different kinds of scientific expertise in the room. Complex problems require complex solutions. For example, you want to solve a water management crisis. You're going to need an engineer, a hydrologist, a social scientist, and a strategic planner. If you want to solve for and manage for a future of sea level rise, you're going to need a quantitative modeler. You're going to need an oceanographer, an earth scientist, a coastal ecologist, and an urban planner. The diversity of scientific expertise should take your breath away. There is a galaxy of scientific diversity out there. And that intellectual diversity makes science, the frontier of basic science, stronger and better. And it also makes the real world application and problem solving of science stronger and better. The same is true for scientists. We too are galaxies of racial, social, economic, gender, sexual, socioeconomic identities. And we are never separate from that humanity. We are always coupled to it. It is always an inherent part of the work that we do. And we need to speak to this basic truth in public because if we don't have the courage to stand up for our own humanity, 
How will we ever have the courage to stand up for the humanity of the people that science is meant to serve? So here's what I suggest. Instead of checking our humanity at the door to be professional, why don't we just take it with us? Unapologetically, lovingly, brazenly taking our humanity with us. What if we viewed those voices inside of institutions that are criticizing the shortfalls on human rights and social justice inside those institutions, not as problematic, but as voices that are in deep love and alignment with the health of those institutions? What if we did the real deeper work of identifying voices inside of institutions, narcissistic voices, to make America great again, that conflate docility with professionalism? What if being a scientist meant that you fundamentally advocated for human rights and equity in every aspect of your professional service? And you viewed that as inseparable from the way that you operated as a professional. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it is the most effective and efficient way to function as a STEM professional. In this moment, I am reminded of a quote from the poet Audre Lorde, who said, your silence will not protect you. This is true. We may all be professionals, but we're people first. Have the courage to bring your humanity with you.